Well, well, well. Welcome back to another episode of the Recharge Zone podcast. I'm your host, Ann Margaret, and I'm joined by my co-host, Brent. Today, we're going to discuss the topic of groundwater protection at the EAA with Mariah Bonham, Groundwater Protection Coordinator. Welcome, Mariah. Hi, thanks for having me. Mariah, I'm familiar with the groundwater protection initiatives at the EAA because, uh, fun fact, this is the team I started on when I began my career here at EAA uh, just more than 12 years ago now. But for our listeners, can you give them an idea of the types of groundwater protection initiatives we have here at the EAA? Sure. The types of things that the groundwater protection team focuses on is uh, well registration. All water wells withdrawing from the Edwards Aquifer are required to be registered with the EAA. So this includes wells uh, in our jurisdiction. So that's Hayes, Comal, uh, Guadalupe, Bayer, Medina, and Uvalde counties. Part of the well registration process uh, involves having an, an inspection performed by EAA staff to confirm the surface condition, the location, and the use of the well of any wells. And we also survey within our jurisdiction for abandoned wells. So where we find an abandoned well, we notify the property owner of a potential abandoned well issue and we provide guidance toward the remediation of that well. And another thing that our team does, we issue well construction permits to provide property owners and their water well contractor the specifications for appropriately drilling those wells. The specifications are designed to ensure that the protection of the Edwards Aquifer water quality is maintained. Uh, Through the permitting program, we can also confirm the use and well design similar uh, in some ways to our well registration and inspection initiatives. Thanks for giving uh, that broad overview, but can you kind of elaborate, you know, for our listeners who might be wondering what exactly a well is and that wells required to be looked at and closely monitored. So wells are direct conduits that are also referred to by the EAA and I think other agencies as man-made boreholes um, drilled into the aquifer, but sometimes they can transect the Edwards aquifer to access a different aquifer. Is that correct, Mariah? Yes. And can you explain what a well looks like and how deep wells can actually be? Sure. So uh, wells can be any depth, uh, but essentially a water well is a hole in the ground drilled to access groundwater. Uh, They typically look like a piece of pipe or PVC sticking up out of the ground. Uh, Most are about four to eight inches in diameter. Um, Water wells in this area can be shallower and not access the Edwards. They can access a shallower groundwater unit, or they may be deeper and access uh, the Trinity Aquifer below the Edwards if, um, if the Edwards in a particular location does not produce enough water. So that's, that's why we kind of require um, people to notify us when they're drilling a well or if they find a well on their property, if it's like a newly acquired property, right? Because we want to identify if it's accessing the Edwards Aquifer, if it's in good condition, or if it's drilling through to, to get a different type of water, right? Absolutely. So any water, well, dr- water wells drilled in the state, they do need to have, the driller needs to supply a driller's report to the state to ensure that it is drilled to the minimum standards required. Okay. And then kind of going back to what you said, you know, they wells can be four to eight inches in diameter. I mean, that's not... That's not that big. Um, that's I would say that that's most wells. Okay. Uh, wells can be much larger than that, but generally most of, like like a municipal or an industrial well, they can be quite large. They can be 24, 36 uh-huh. inches in diameter. I oh, mean, wow. but for the most part, most wells that you'll find uh, small domestic wells for the household or old livestock wells, they're, they're usually about four to eight inches in diameter. That's just kind of a generally what we find. I see. So then to our, for our public and for our listeners, that's why some wells can just kind of go virtually undetected, right? Or not noticed by people because they can be unassuming if they're just smaller wells. A smaller well. And I mean, sometimes it literally looks like a pipe sticking out of the ground. Um, it, occasionally it's gotten confused with a signpost or a fence post. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> that's interesting. And I bet there's times in my life where I've been like, oh, there's a hole in the ground. I bet it's something like that. Yeah, and even uh, older wells, you might not even see them at all because that might be flush mount, so the the well is level to the ground or below the ground. So wow. these are older, deteriorated wells. You may not notice them at all. Um, 
So, Mariah, can you explain to us a day in the life of your job and walk us through what Groundwater Protection Team does here at the EAA? Sure. Sure. So, I guess in a nutshell, um, our job in, in the Groundwater Protection Team is to find all the wells. It's uh, really important to maintain a record of all Edwards wells in our jurisdiction. Um, that also includes wells that may have been plugged years ago or even decades ago because those records of those wells often have really valuable geologic information such as the depths at the top of the Edwards aquifer at that given location or they may have historic water levels. Uh, We also want to document any non-Edwards wells in areas where there might be mixed Edwards and non-Edwards wells. Um, It's really really useful uh, when we get inquiries from uh, from well owners um, or drillers or a developer because they come across something that they think is a well or they have a well and they know nothing about it at all. And so they can reach out to us and say, hey, what do I have here? And we might actually have that record. We may have like a written record of that. So uh, one of the ways that we do that is we research any available records of wells Um, Significantly older wells, we review uh, historic published materials. Uh, The U.S. Geological Survey did a lot of canvassing uh, of water wells back in the 1930s to 50s, and they published a whole bunch of reports on water wells in our area. Um, I I think one of the oldest reports is from 1898 that actually mentions some of the wells drilled during that time period. And why, why did they do so much canvassing? Um, Back in the 1950s, uh, the late 40s and 50s was, of course, the historic drought of record. And so right around that time period, they did a lot of water level monitoring and they took so many water levels across the entire region. And I think part of that was um, spurred on by the drought itself. And then um, at the same time, they wanted the drilling information. So they Mm -hmm. wanted to know about the water levels, but the water levels, you need more information than just a water level. You need to know where that well is located, and then you need to know what aquifer it's accessing. And so they have the drilling information, and they have the casing depth information, which is really important because it gives you an indication as to whether that water level means anything. Oh, fascinating. So um, in addition, um, since about the mid-60s, we review... uh, water well drillery reports. Um, Since the mid 60s, drillers had to start submitting drillers reports to the state. So we uh, come across these drillers reports and we will do the property records research. Um, I didn't realize how much of my job would be looking into appraisal district records and property records, Um, but I kind of like history. And so it's, you find a lot of really interesting things. You you find about um, information on on families that, that go back, uh, you know, 100 years on their properties. And so it's, it's, it's just interesting to find all of those old historic names. So, okay, this is such a, a different question from kind of what we're talking about. But so like you're saying, you you enjoyed the historical aspect of it. So can a well that was drilled like in the 1930s still be in good condition? Or is there something that people have to do to kind of make sure that you know what I mean? Like the legacy of your family using, living on the same property and using the same well, is that typically something that you see or is it like they plug it or they do something different and they drill a new well? Because there's families who their livelihood depends on them growing food and having wells and having access to water. So to me, that's like just an interesting thing, is those stories that go along with it. Yeah, yeah. I've, um, it's really interesting um, in searching for these old records um, that I come across a lot of uh, the old names that we're familiar with. Um, just, just, you know, in the San Antonio area, you know, Wurzbach, yeah. uh, Tetzel, uh, Goss, um, Clausen. You know, these are all families, and all these families had, you know, uh, these ranches, and they had water wells on them. So it's just fascinating to look back at the history, uh, history of its people, because the history of mankind is the history of its water. Yeah. So it's uh, it's really interesting how those those two kind of collide when I'm I'm looking for water well records and I find out, you know, history of a family and that's I don't know. I think that's kinda neat. I think it's interesting. Super too. interesting. <laughs> yeah. So um uh, the other way that we, we look for, for water wells and try and document water wells is um, you know, utilizing aerial imagery, historic aerial imagery 
And um, we, we can also go into the field and look for water wells. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's really important for us to document anything. Um, and so we can, we can do that a number of ways. So that's, you know, records research um, and aerial imagery, historic aerial imagery, uh, plats and surveys, and of course, actually going in the field and looking for these. So this team, uh, the other thing that this team does, we process all well construction, well capping, and well plugging permit applications for Edwards Aquifer wells in our jurisdiction and any drill through permits. So that's any wells that are drilled into a unit below the Edwards Aquifer. We ensure that those are properly constructed. And so we process those well construction applications for any drill throughs too. So it sounds like there's a lot of facets to groundwater protection as it pertains to the work that we do at the EAA, but it also sounds like there's a commitment when you install a well or drill a well, um, and it requires care and attention and maintenance. What are some things that well owners can do to protect the groundwater? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. It is uh, definitely a commitment. Um, for a well owner, um, maintaining your well is important because it's your water supply. You, you want to make sure that your water supply is not compromised in any way. Um, you can, first of all, start by checking in with a licensed water well contractor periodically. Um, your your pump is going to be need, need to be replaced. It's, it's just like a car. Something goes wrong with your car. Something always breaks on your car, and so it needs to be fixed. But you also have a level of maintenance that you need to, to do on your car to keep it in good condition. So, um, a licensed water well contractor, they can usually be pretty helpful in terms of letting you know that if they suspect anything is wrong with your well. Um, do they suspect that the casing has any holes or cracks in it? Um, you don't want holes or cracks in the casing because that could allow shallow groundwater of potentially lower water quality to enter your well. Um, does the water well contractor suspect any obstructions in your well? Uh, do they suspect any issues of water quality? So I would say, um, as a well owner, to start simple. Um, it's not uncommon for me to see that water wells are located in a small shed on a property along with the, the pump components for the well. And uh, well owners uh, sometimes use these really convenient areas to store normal household chemicals or paint or fuels. Um, I would recommend well owners ensure the immediate area around the actual wellhead is free from these types of items. Um, also, as a well owner, if you notice that your well head at the surface has maybe some significant corrosion and the steel casing um, is maybe flaking away, uh, you should really consider having a licensed well water well contractor rework the surface completion to bring that well head up to, um, these days, it's uh, at least 12 inches above the ground level and ensure that there's a, a nice uh, sturdy cement pad around the well. Uh, it just kind of serves as an extra layer of protection from any potential surface contaminants right there at the location of the wellhead. And is the, so you said 12 inches above ground level, is that, is that because like you said, I know you mentioned it's an extra layer of protection, but it, it protects the well from things like surface run, runoff and, and things of that nature, right? Absolutely. So um, yeah, for any surface runoff, and, and as I mentioned, um, sometimes a well is located in a nice pump house that uh, serves guess. as yeah that serves as like a really nice location for you to store some stuff um and yeah so you certainly don't want any paints or chemicals spilling over and uh getting into that well or you know into the immediate vicinity around that well so it's really important to have your well head above ground level and uh, have a nice uh, cement pad yeah to yeah. prevent those things okay yeah. i see yeah, unfortunately, I've seen that too. People will store, you know, pesticides or herbicides in the shed where the well is because that's their garden shed. Yeah. But it's just not a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So I, of course, wanted to mention as well that for, for someone who has a well, if you have a well and you don't need it, uh, you should probably go ahead and temporarily cap that well. Um, we issue EAA capping permits to ensure that no contamination can enter the well. Um, at a later date, uh, the well owner can always reactivate that well, put a pump in it, get electrical to that well, and then they can utilize that well. Um, if you are a well owner and you foresee no need for a well in the future, uh, you should really consider plugging that well entirely. Um, this process involves a licensed water well contractor filling the well with gravel and cement to the surface, and that puts the well out of use permanently. 
And at that point, the well owner is free from any further well-related responsibilities. So Mariah, I know you and your team, you all look at thousands of wells just in our area. And a big part of that is identifying wells that have since become abandoned, which are wells that are not unused or they've been forgotten, deteriorated. And the EAA works to identify these throughout our jurisdiction. What are some ways the groundwater protection team works to find these abandoned wells? Sure. So um, it's a lot of that research that I already talked about, uh, researching old well records and uh, looking at some historic aerial imagery, uh, surveys, plats, um, property records. So we do a lot of research first. And um, if we're pretty confident there's a well on a piece of property that we suspect might be abandoned, um, we would contact that that property owner and inform them, hey, we believe that you have a well, um, and there's a possibility that it could be abandoned, um, so we would coordinate with them. Um, if it's a property that is going to be developed, um, usually during the development process, there's always an initial environmental assessment in which any water wells might be located during the initial assessment, and then they start development. So they get it, I mean, as, as everyone well knows in this area, it's developing so quickly. I mean, yeah. there's just, just housing is, is going in at such a high rate. And um, it's, you know, demand, of course, uh, drives that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very quick process between um, initially evaluating a piece of property for development and development actually occurring and roads being cleared, the land's cleared, and the roads are put in. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's something that we really have to stay on top of because uh, any property owner who has a well, the well is their responsibility. Okay. So um, it just depends on what the developer wants to do. Um, if they want to retain that well, then they just need to ensure that the well is in good working condition. Um, and then if they want to temporarily cap the well, um, that by the way, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's a temporary cap, usually a piece of steel that's been uh, welded or bolted on mm -hmm. to the top of a well to ensure that nothing can get into the well. Um, if they foresee no need for that well, and that's that's most of what we find for most developers, the mm -hmm. land's going to be cleared and there's going to be buildings or homes built over it, uh, they will plug that well permanently. I see. Can you share with us an experience um, out in the field <laughs> looking for one of these? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, Hayes, Cabal, and uh, Bear Counties especially, but Let's not forget about some of our more rural counties. Uh, Guadalupe County um, is developing a lot, and Medina County and Uvalde counties are experiencing a lot of development. Me and a coworker, we had we'd located some information that uh, a water well uh, was located on a piece of property under active development. We had gotten contacted by another agency, and uh, so we actually had documentation of the well. It was part of our groundwater protection initiative in which it was a registered well that we had gone and inspected um, a number of years ago. So we had photos, we had coordinates, um, we knew we knew exactly where that well was located and so the uh, uh, the developer had already cleared the land and put in a road and in fact the road terminated less than five feet from where that well was located and it was, it was a windmill well and um, uh, it had already been cleared and it was already buried over. So um, so we're thinking uh, during the initial development, someone probably marked the well location, um, usually like with some orange tape or orange paint or something. Um, maybe the marker fell or, or it blew away. I mean, it's, it's really common for that to happen. Um, then someone else uh, removed the windmill tower. And, uh, oh. it's, <laughs> and maybe later, uh, you know, an operator, they saw a pipe sticking out of the ground, didn't know what it was. Maybe they thought it was a fence post. That's true, um, like we mentioned earlier. Yes, yes. Or maybe they didn't see it at all. Maybe there was some brush that was covering the, the steel casing at the surface, um, and they cleared over the well, not realizing that it was there. And so we were extremely fortunate. We were able to get in there, and since we had those coordinates, we had the pictures of the well, um, right. we were able to get out there with, in, in just two days. We were able to, like when we initially found it, we found the old records, we found the photos that we had. So we were able to identify uh, using the magnetometer, um, which, which is our fancy uh, metal detector, we were able to identify a very small area where the well was actually located. And we did that based on the, um, 
the pictures that we had from uh, when we had inspected the well, the coordinates that we took. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we were able to give the developer a very, very exact location of where they needed to excavate over about uh, maybe two by two or four by four foot, mm -hmm. which is a savings to the developer because otherwise if we didn't have that information, we would be going off of maybe just Google Earth imagery. And so we could only pinpoint to maybe about a 20 foot by 20 foot location that they needed to excavate. And luckily that well was only about six inches below the surface, but still that's a savings that we were able to pinpoint almost exactly where that well was based on uh, the location of the, the windmill posts or the, the tower. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, so I know you mentioned this earlier, like a, a lot of what you do is, is looking through historical documentation and researching for these types of things. But like you just mentioned, you're actually going out in the field and clearing through brush or like, not saying that you have a shovel and you're like digging in the ground, but I mean, you could be, right? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, see, we I are mean, definitely out there with shovels sometimes. It's like a hands-on, <laughs> yes. full-on. I mean, and you, if you think about it, I mean, you, you said it earlier with the metal detector. I mean, it's kind of, it's like you're finding buried treasure, but I mean, unfortunately, you're finding, you're trying to find if where the well is and yes and, and in this particular case uh it was it paid off because we were able to that the site was actively being cleared i mean there were there were excavators out there um they had already built the roads up to within five feet of that well and so we i mean had we waited any longer i mean potentially that well would have been destroyed oh wow so this is not an easy job i like i talked about early on i did this uh, first starting out and you're going off of records that are decades old, potentially going out to sites where the well may have been abandoned for decades. Um, it can be really challenging sometimes to find where these things are, but it's critical because if development builds up around them or over them, um, the well is essentially down there, sort of like a ticking time bomb for any contaminants that can find that opening down to the aquifer. In San Antonio or in this whole area, we're lucky that in the artesian zone, um, the aquifer is covered by sort of a protective layer of clay that prevents contaminants from leaching down. But if there are wells penetrating that, mm. it makes it easy for them to get in there. Wow. So I've been in Mariah's shoes. I know that's a hard job. So. So, and, and specifically poorly constructed wells. Yes. So wells that are not maybe not fully cased down to that protective clay layer, or maybe they're not cemented. The, the casing is not cemented in place all the way down to that protective clay layer. So having a well, or even if you're buying property well, wh where they might identify a well is, it's a, it's a full-time job then essentially, is making sure that this well that you're acquiring, or if you find a well on your property, is not in any way going to pose a threat to the groundwater. I mean, the groundwater is what, you know, what, where we get our drinking water from for our jurisdiction, for sure. all of the population, right? For sure. If you are a well owner, or if you're purchasing a piece of property with a well on it, Try to get some information on that well um, if you if you can find uh, if you can find the actual drillers report um, that would that would be a lot of useful useful information. It would tell you how deep the casing is, how much uh, cementing is behind that casing. So that cements it basically cements the casing to the borehole wall. Mm -hmm. They drill the they drill the hole, they insert the casing to provide some structural integrity for that well, and then they cement that casing in place. And so you, that's really valuable information. Um, it also lists uh, water levels, which is important for where the pump needs to be set so that you make sure that the water level um, has, there, that there's a good water column and that your well doesn't go dry. Mm, so it's wow. really useful information. Um, so I would suggest, uh, since we maintain that type of well record, definitely check with us. Um, our team email um, is well registration at edwardsaquifer.org if you need to get some information on a well, um, maybe on a piece of property that you own or a piece of property that you're thinking about buying or just, just in general. Um, you can also check with some of the drillers. Um, what's really interesting about a lot of the drillers in this area is that their families have been drilling wells for 100 years. Wow. So you have where, you know, uh, the... The grandson is drilling wells today. His daddy and his granddaddy before him were drilling wells. And so they have so much knowledge. And so uh, definitely draw on the knowledge that they have, too. Wow. 
Well, 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 Mariah, this has been a <laughs> lot of information to take in. And I'm so glad you shared that email for folks that have questions about their own well to reach out to you all to get more information or to just understand their own well better. Um, but we really appreciate you joining us today and, and sharing all this information. If anyone has questions about um, their well or, or wants to know more, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, Mariah, for joining us on this episode of the Recharge Zone podcast. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Recharge Zone podcast. Have questions, ideas for topics, or things you would like to share with us? Well, reach out to us at rechargezone at edwardsaquifer.org.